It was one of the world's biggest cyber heists. A bank robbery of the online age that no amount of armed guards, armored cars, and heavily protected vaults could prevent. It was like a terrorist attack in the, into the central bank. More than $80 million stolen from Bangladesh's central bank by hackers who, authorities say, tricked one of the world's most trusted financial institutions. It would have dropped like a bomb at the New York Fed. Only one official is facing charges, and most of the money is still missing. There is no way that um, this could have been done by just one or two rogue employees. She is but a pawn in a high-stakes game uh, made by international bankers. It's a crime which exposed serious failings in the international banking system, and it could have been much, much worse. How in the world could a staggering 81 million, almost billion, uh, be lost in a transfer system? I'm Andrew Wilson, and I'm going to follow the trail of the stolen funds from Dhaka to Manila and New York to find out how the hackers did it and ask who was behind the heist and could it happen again? Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. A teeming, chaotic city and one of the world's poorest. 17 million people live here, a third of them surviving on less than $2 a day. Many eking out a living on the city's polluted waterways and crowded streets. Bangladesh has one of the world's fastest growing economies. It's a country on the up, but one that could ill afford to lose more than $80 million of taxpayers' money. Bangladesh Bank, the country's central bank, is at the heart of its economic system. It overlooks a busy roundabout in Dhaka's financial district. High walls and tight security to stop anyone getting in who shouldn't be there. But sometimes, physical barriers aren't enough. For this heist, nobody broke in and nobody took anything away. The entire crime was perpetrated electronically. On the evening of Thursday, February the 4th, 2016, the start of the weekend in Muslim Bangladesh, most of the central bank staff had gone home. The building was secure, but intruders were already inside. In an interim report, experts commissioned by Bangladesh Bank said a malicious program was installed on the bank's computer systems. The malware, possibly delivered via an infected email, collected passwords and usernames, and covered its own tracks. Investigators say they found considerable evidence that the hackers used the bank's credentials to access SWIFT, the international messaging system used to send money around the world. The hackers then generated 35 requests to transfer funds from Bangladesh Bank's account with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The orders came close to a billion dollars. Most of the requests were blocked, but four did get through, and as a result, almost $81 million was sent to accounts at a bank called RCBC, thousands of miles away in the Philippines. I, I couldn't believe it, I tell you. Because nothing like that, even a smaller thing like that never happened. So I was, I was dumb, and actually, for, for a while. Atiyah Rahman was the governor of the bank when its systems were compromised and the money was stolen. You know, I'm not blaming SWIFT, I'm not blaming FED, I'm not blaming Bangladesh Bank, but the entire system was not strong enough to really withstand the kind of attack that it got. 
All institutions touched by the heist have denied they were at fault for the losses. They have, however, taken steps to improve security. According to one senior Bangladesh police investigator in late 2016, there were serious security lapses which made the central bank vulnerable. Reuters journalist Serajul Kadir has spoken to police sources and insiders at Bangladesh Bank. Yeah, cyber security was quite, uh, I mean, vulnerable. It was very weak and it was not up to the mark, I mean, uh, with the present, uh, with the modern technology. Police headquarters in downtown Dhaka. Detectives here are working with authorities in other countries in what has become an international investigation. They've yet to confirm how the hackers got into the system. We process all the data and uh, FBI is helping us, uh, Interpol is helping us, and we are trying to find out uh, the conclusive uh, evidence we, we get maybe soon. Investigators are sifting through 10 terabytes of data in the hunt for a smoking gun that might identify the culprits. Though no bank insiders have been charged over the heist, police say they must fully investigate the possibility. We are looking into that. Maybe a bank employee? Uh, yes, maybe. Bangladesh Bank denies that anyone on the inside was involved and also denies negligence. The police have not charged anyone from Bangladesh Bank in relation to the heist. To find out more, I contacted one of the private sector cybersecurity companies that have investigated the methods used by the hackers. What were your thoughts when you heard that this central bank had been hacked? Yeah, the, the early indicators show that this, they likely got in through some sort of spear phishing message. So basically they sent an email to someone and then that person basically clicked on that email and had their computer system infected. Now, they were going after what's called the SWIFT terminals. These are the terminals or computers that are responsible for conducting large bank transfers between organizations or even countries. It's basically they're modifying the applications on the computer that has sort of been hijacked. And remember, those computers are actually inside the bank. This is a case where this institution was compromised more so than anything SWIFT specific. Within weeks, the central bank governor, Atiyah Rahman, felt he had to resign. They were blaming the institution. They're blaming the governor. Then I thought, you know, the, the central bank is a very sacred place. It's a very, 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 I would say, highly esteemed place. You cannot just, you know, uh, put uh, mud on it uh, uh, the way you are liking. So I, I took myself, not only myself away, I tried to protect the central bank, the integrity of the central bank. In Bangladesh, the investigation into who stole the $81 million continues, but it's quite possible that the hackers may actually have never set foot in the country. The missing millions were sent overseas, and I'm following the money trail to the Philippines, where electronic wire transfers became hard cash. This is the story of one of the world's biggest cyber heists. How hackers stole tens of millions of dollars from Bangladesh's central bank and appear to have got away with it. To try to find out how, I've come to Manila. It's the sprawling capital of the Philippines and one of the fastest growing cities in Asia. This is a society that thrives on its links to the outside world. One of its biggest exports is workers. More than two million Filipinos work overseas and send more than $25 billion a year in remittances to their loved ones back home. It's a flow of revenue that helps drive the country's economy. Manila's business district has expanded substantially over the last decade, but its banking sector operates under unusually strict secrecy laws. 
and that includes the institution which helped turn the transfers from Bangladesh into hard cash. It was by sending money here that the thieves effectively made their getaway. $81 million of Bangladesh Bank's funds ended up in this local branch of a bank called RCBC. And they did it using bank accounts that had been opened months earlier using fake IDs and had since lain inactive. The hackers had sent payment requests from Bangladesh Bank to the New York Fed on Thursday. And by Friday, the money had hit accounts at RCBC in Manila. It was then moved between an array of other accounts controlled by a remittance company called Philrem, and some of it was converted into Philippine pesos. Over a period of 10 days, the money was transferred electronically and in cash and channeled into Manila's casino industry. The accounts here on Jupiter Street were a vital clue for investigators. They were crucial for laundering the money. And someone had set them up using false names and fake credentials. The question is, who? The Philippine Senate held an inquiry into the laundering of the proceeds of the heist. It heard that the accounts were opened by the manager of the RCBC Jupiter Street branch, a woman called Maya De Guito. You tell the truth here. Um, Your Honor, I will tell the truth. She says she opened the accounts for this man, a Manila casino owner and agent she'd known for several years called Kim Wong, who also gave evidence at the inquiry. Maya De Guito declined to be interviewed for this program, but she testified to the inquiry that she had actually met four people whose names were on the accounts. She's been represented by a lawyer who has an unusual taste in art. Mr. Wong vouched for their identities, presented documents uh, uh, which showed their identities and requested her to open accounts in her branch on behalf of these five individuals. And uh, with the promise that um, a substantial amount would come into these accounts. Wong hasn't been formally charged over the heist, but is subject to civil action. He denied De Guito's version of events and denied knowing that the money was stolen. Wala akong kinalaman sa pagpeke ng bank documents para pumasok ng pera sa bansa. Hindi, ako, hindi ko alam ang pinagmulan ng 81 million dollars. Si Maya ang nagpeke lang sinasabing limang bank accounts. Isang foreigner lang po ang nilifer ko kay Maya. RCBC Bank was fined close to $20 million for failing to comply with banking regulations, and its chief executive and president resigned. The bank said it accepted the findings of the regulator and wants to move on. The company's lawyer says Maya De Guito was a rogue employee. The branch manager says that she was naive that she was a pawn in a much larger plan, which she didn't clearly understand at the time. I disagree with that. She knows the banking system. She's trained of all the policies of the bank, so uh, I don't agree with that one. Just because she's trained in the policies of the bank, is that enough for RCBC to conclude that she is a, a single or a rogue employee within one branch? It was actually the, uh, all the circumstances taken together. Number one is that she knew about these accounts. She set it up. Second is when she was obviously waiting for the funds to be credited. And when it was credited, she acted with lightning speed in getting these accounts out of the beneficiary accounts into other accounts. The Senate report documented the timing of the payments. Many were made within minutes of each other. Maya De Guito's lawyers say that when funds were received on February the 5th, she confirmed the legitimacy of the remittances with RCBC head office and received emails confirming they were from valid sources. Her legal team say she didn't have authority to unilaterally prevent transfers and their client was told there was no reason to hold the funds. 
Following an investigation by anti-money laundering authorities, the Philippine Department of Justice has recommended that Maya de Guito be charged with eight counts of money laundering. Her legal team is trying to quash the charges against her, but if the case goes ahead, she will plead not guilty. Sergio Osmeña, a former Philippine senator who sat on the committee looking into the heist, says he doesn't believe seven days of testimony uncovered the whole story. We couldn't quite get her to explain everything because we did not give her witness protection program. So I, I left it up to the AMLA. I said, OK, AMLA, you, you take care of Maya de Guito. They filed a case against her already, so she had to stop talking in, in the Senate because anything she said would be used against her in the case. At the Senate inquiry, one of de Guito's former colleagues said that at the time of the heist, she talked about being threatened. Marami po siyang sinabi, pero ang nag-stuck lang po sa mind ko na, sabi niya, I would rather do this than me being killed or my family. De Guito's lawyer denies the threat was made. He says she's determined to prove her innocence and didn't know she was being used to bring fraudulent money into the country. He also says she's been offered a deal to speak to the FBI, which has been leading an international investigation into the heist. The FBI has declined to comment. Yes, uh, there was an offer. Uh, it was a standard offer for her. Uh, the, it came under the nomenclature of a, a queen for a day. We're in, as she would say, everything, and she would be given limited immunity. Uh, we, we came to the conclusion that uh, it would not offer enough protection uh, for my client, uh, so we had to uh, politely decline the offer of the FBI. When the money left RCBC, it was paid to accounts at the Philrem Remittance Company. Philrem was run by Michael and Salud Bautista. They, along with Kim Wong and the company that owns a casino called Solaire, are the subject of pending legal action by money laundering authorities to try to recover some of the stolen money. Kim Wong and Solaire say they are complying with the authorities. The Bautistas have not responded to our request for comment. We accounted the $81 million and uh, we filed several civil for future cases against Solaire against the company of Kim Wong, against Kim Wong himself, and uh, Phil Rem. And the total of our claim is around more or less $81 million. The AMLC also filed criminal complaints against Maya De Guito, Kim Wong, and Phil Rem executives, including Salut and Michael Batista. They were considered by the Philippines Department of Justice. But the only case the Justice Department is pursuing is that against Maya de Guito. The AMLC has asked them to reconsider the complaint against Wong and the Bautistas and is waiting for a decision. Wong has declined to comment and the Bautistas have not responded to our inquiries. We asked the Department of Justice why it wasn't taking the other cases forward, but it declined to comment. One stumbling block for the Senate's inquiry was the unusually high level of privacy afforded to bank accounts. The Philippines, along with Switzerland and Lebanon, has one of the most secretive banking sectors in the world. These secrecy laws are almost unique to the Philippines banking system, although it has to be said widely supported by the majority of lawmakers here. But that privacy for all accounts held in this country made life extremely difficult for the Senate investigators trying to trace the missing millions, keeping doors firmly closed that many of them would gladly have seen opened. Kim Wong's uh, bank account, we couldn't get it. Phil Rem's bank account, we couldn't get it. Why? <laughs> bank Secrecy Act. It, it, it stopped us from getting the whole picture, it stopped us from tracing the money, because we, we couldn't get the... the uh, bank accounts of anybody. Almost $15 million has been recovered, according to the official Philippine Senate report, some of it handed over by Kim Wong, who denied knowing it was stolen. The AMLC says Philrem still holds $17 million of the stolen money and is suing for its return. The company denies it has the money. 
Almost $50 million has been traced to casinos and gambling junket operators, according to the AMLC investigation. But none of that $67 million has been recovered. Gambling junkets are paid-for trips that attract high-spending visitors, many from China. According to the Senate report, most of the $81 million was channeled to casinos and junkets, which were effectively being used by the criminals to complete the getaway. It said tens of millions of dollars from the heist were used to buy chips that were gambled by junket groups on Manila's tables. According to the inquiry, one group had known winnings of more than $5 million, but the junket operators could have made much more than that. The casinos denied knowing where the money came from, and it's not known whether the gamblers knew the money they'd borrowed to play was stolen. Wong, who had years of experience with junkets in Manila, told the Senate inquiry the men who got the funds into the casinos were Chinese nationals. Gao Shuhua, who he'd known for eight years, and Ding Jiu, who was based in Macau. The inquiry said much of the money was transferred to casino accounts in Ding's name. The men are of high interest to investigators. They were gone. They left the country. Well, I, I don't know because there's no record of their having left the country, but they were gone. We, we couldn't get hold of them. How do you think it was so easy for them to disappear? Oh, it's easy in this country. If you have a very porous border and you bribe anybody and, 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 you, and you'll get out. The casinos were used for turning the electronic money transfers into hard cash, though there's been no inference they knew the funds were stolen. They weren't covered by money laundering laws at the time and weren't required to record large transactions. For Sergio Osmeña's committee, the heist exposed serious flaws, and they were flaws that were predictable. I was concerned, especially in 2010, when, when they were going to develop the four big casinos here. When they did that, I said, it's time that we updated our money laundering law because this is going to be very bad for us. The, the senators knew and the congressmen knew that money laundering would, would happen, except that they're probably going to wait for the first big, <laughs> big thing to explode. And so it so happened that in 2016, this thing exploded. So we were able to get them to plug the loophole on the money laundering and casinos. The Senate's inquiry made more than a dozen recommendations, which included extending money laundering laws to casinos and making it easier to access information about bank accounts. New laws covering the casinos were passed in July 2017, and earlier that year, the Philippines appointed a new central bank governor who vowed to make it harder for dirty money to enter the financial system. But Osmeña says he found it hard to get politicians to act. We have the strictest bank secrecy law in the world, and I can't get any of my congressmen and senators to amend that law. That's another reason why it still would be tempting for somebody to come and launder money in the country. There are strong links between the casino industry in the Philippines and the Chinese gambling haven of Macau. And it's there I'm heading next. I've come to Macau, a former Portuguese colony, now part of China, that many called the Las Vegas of the East.
Macau was the home of the junket, organized gambling holidays where Chinese high rollers could get round domestic currency restrictions by borrowing millions of dollars from the operators to pour onto the Baccarat tables and pay it back when they got home. According to Kim Wong, it was in Macau that Ding Chizhu, one of the Chinese men who operated the junkets in the Philippines, was based. And a crackdown in Macau and weak money laundering laws in the Philippines made Manila's gambling tables increasingly attractive to Chinese high rollers. Restrictions on cash moving from the Chinese mainland to Macau had been introduced because of concern that corrupt officials were betting embezzled money there, in casinos where, according to one supervisor, few questions were asked. Tell us about how people enjoy the gambling. Why is it addictive? Uh And according to Benny Sio, no one pays too much attention to the source of the money. Uh this whole junket model in Macau is now under serious pressure. The Chinese government has tightened outgoing capital flows and beefed up its anti-corruption operations, and the authorities here are cooperating with that. The downside of such crackdowns for countries like the Philippines is that the money launderers simply move on. New York City, one of the world's biggest financial centers and home to one of its most important financial institutions. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York, or the Fed. Its Manhattan headquarters sit on top of 508,000 gold bars and it handles around $800 billion of payments every day. Jonathan Spicer reports on its activity, which moves markets around the world. Well, no one thinks of the Federal Reserve in terms of cyber heists, usually. Uh, you think of, you know, economics, you think of labor markets, you think of uh, macro models that the U.S. Central Bank and its economists are pouring over to try to decide what to do about interest rates. It turns out, of course, that uh, there's about three and a half trillion dollars of foreign funds uh, being held at the New York Fed. Uh, and the Fed is uh, basically the uh, account custodian for 250 uh, foreign entities around the world. And its customers included Bangladesh's central bank. And it was to the New York Fed that the hackers sent 35 messages requesting payments from the Bangladesh bank account. Things could have been a lot worse, but for an extraordinary coincidence. Millions of dollars, hundreds of millions, were never transferred because the name Jupiter in the address for the bank happened to match that of an oil tanker. Nothing to do with the heist, but on the list of US sanctions against Iran. As a result, most of the transfer orders were flagged as suspicious and blocked by the Fed. And there were other reasons the transfer requests could have aroused suspicion. They were different to most payments made by Bangladesh Bank. They weren't formatted properly. And these were large payments to individuals rather than organizations. But largely because the requests appeared to be authenticated by SWIFT, $81 million was sent. When I use my card in a foreign country, for example, or for a sudden large purchase, it can trigger a simple fraud inquiry from my bank. Real-time monitoring. The technology is quite straightforward. But in the case of the heist, nothing like that happened at the Fed. The vast majority of these uh, payment requests that arrive on the doorstep of the New York Fed are automatically uh, executed. Uh, you know, they come to the SWIFT network, 
Um, they have all the boxes ticked. Uh, they're Swift authenticated. Uh, and so they automatically uh, go out the door. But Fed staff were concerned enough about some of the payments to try to contact Bangladesh Bank. At the end of Thursday, they sent a message using Swift and two more on Friday. But hackers had compromised Bangladesh Bank's SWIFT system and sabotaged a crucial printer in the Dhaka office. It wasn't until Saturday that Bangladesh Bank staff realized what had happened and tried to contact the Fed urgently, but could only use numbers they found on the internet, lines that weren't answered at the weekend. On Monday, Bangladesh Bank finally got messages through to New York saying they'd been hacked. They would have been seen as staff arrived for work in New York at 7.30 in the morning. Former Fed employees familiar with the bank's workings told Reuters that the news would have been devastating. People said it would have dropped like a bomb. Someone said everyone would have freaked out. Uh, every lawyer within the U.S. Central Bank would have been contacted. And this explains in part why uh, when, this, uh, when the gravity of the situation did occur to the New York Fed, there was a very odd and very troubling, uh, from Bangladesh's perspective, uh, a period of silence that lasted almost a day. One former insider at the Fed said there would have been concern that its payment system had been exploited by the hackers. It was definitely a surprise uh, because I know that they take security so seriously there at the Fed and they, they put so much energy towards making sure that only the right people have the right access to the right information at the right time. Were you surprised when you found that, the, that, that such a large amount of money had passed through the, uh, through the Fed and out the other side? Well, the Fed certainly manages a lot of money every single day, and I think the people that work there are aware that it's a very high-stakes game, uh, whatever work that they're doing there. So uh, the dollar amounts didn't phase me. It was more about the idea of uh, that, that there was any kind of security breach and that anything had gone wrong uh, in the procedures or the communication between different central banks. And the implications of what had happened were sinking in beyond the banks. Once it became clear that an internationally recognized and respected institution like the Federal Reserve had been caught up in the heist, questions started being asked here in Washington. Alarm bells were ringing about security and reputation, and U.S. lawmakers wanted answers. U.S. Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney was one of the first public officials in America to ask questions. How could this happen? This is, this is the Fed, the Federal Reserve. Uh, this isn't any bank. This is the backbone of the financial system, not only in America, but in the world. And how in the world could a staggering 81 million, almost billion, uh, be lost in a transfer system? And if the transfer system doesn't work and it's not accurate, then it puts a whole banking system, the international banking system, at risk. I was like uh, horrified. If this transfer wasn't secure, then no transfer is secure. So it's a very, very serious uh, issue, and, and cybersecurity, I would say, is one of the most uh, uh, pressing issues of our time. The Fed declined our invitation to provide someone for interview, but said this. While the event in February 2016 did not result in a breach or compromise of the New York Fed systems, we did view this as an opportunity to further strengthen the safety of global payments. The New York Fed performs certain screening of and diligence on funds transfers sent both to and from the accounts of foreign central banks on our books. The robustness of cybersecurity around the global payment system must continue to be a priority for each participant in the chain. Finger pointing was happening both privately and publicly, as it turned out, between the Federal Reserve, uh, Bangladesh, SWIFT, and then increasingly uh, officials in the Philippines, where much of the money ended up disappearing into the casino system there. Uh, so you had the squabble that uh, became louder and louder and more and more public. Uh, and, and then also the New York Fed uh, took some steps, uh, as, as we reported, uh, based on conversations with uh, those familiar with the, with, with the moves, uh, to bring in a 24-hour uh, hotline for all clients, uh, something that, uh, you know, for your everyday observer um, seems like kind of an obvious uh, move, especially when you're sitting atop nearly three and a half trillion dollars. You want to uh, allow for your clients to quickly get in touch with you and not just rely on this swift system and an archaic, uh, an archaic convention of communicating that way. 
Brussels, Belgian capital and home to European institutions as well as the headquarters of SWIFT, a cooperative organization owned by the banks that use it. Well, in 1973, you have to go back to then, uh, banks were sending messages to each other using the telex. Imagine getting 10,000 faxes a day, not very secure, not very automated. So 239 banks from 15 countries said, hey, let's use computers, 1973. Uh, let's use global telecommunications and try to get it to work. And they formed the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, SWIFT. And today, fast forward, it's uh, thousands of banks, hundreds of 200 countries, and uh, trillions of dollars a day flow through the SWIFT network over 10 trillion a day now. And it was SWIFT's messaging system that the hackers accessed to send messages to the Fed. We always realized that SWIFT's weak spot were at the user's terminal, at the, at the, at the endpoints, because we're not responsible for the, the physical security and for them keeping their own passwords safe and secure and other credentials. And, uh, over time, you can imagine as, as cybercrime became much more sophisticated, uh, SWIFT should have been doing more, or could have been doing more, as, as we all know today. SWIFT declined to be interviewed, but said, there is no indication that SWIFT's network or core messaging services have been compromised in the recent attacks on banks. While our customers are individually responsible for the security of their own environments, we fully recognize that the security of the industry as a whole is a shared responsibility. In mid-2016, we launched a customer security program to reinforce the local security of their SWIFT-related infrastructure. And the organization has introduced changes. Users like Bangladesh Bank now require more than just a username and a password to log in. SWIFT has done tremendous things to strengthen its interfaces with two-factor authentication, you know what that is, and other things to strengthen the software. Uh, they've had audit requirements for controls, they're certifying third-party providers, they have daily reconciliation reports, so you see what SWIFT has sent, whether or not you've sent it. <laughs> if it's fraudulent, you'll see it. Um, and. Uh, Anomaly, anomaly detection, you know, you've never sent a message on Friday night to a casino. Maybe we should hold that until we, we talk about it. Uh, they've done a lot. But back in Washington, there are still doubts about depending on a single system. My question is why in the world were you relying so much on one system when you're moving billions and billions of dollars and you're relying on the SWIFT system? Now, if the SWIFT system doesn't work right, then, then the whole thing falls. Under pressure over the heist, changes have been made at some of the big institutions. But will they be enough to stay ahead of the hackers? And who was behind this audacious theft? This is the story of one of the world's biggest cyber heists, how hackers stole $81 million from Bangladesh Central Bank and appear to have got away with it. Or have they? The FBI is on the case and inquiries are continuing around the world. Efforts are being made to trace the missing money, but will the bank ever get it back? Could it happen again? And who was behind it? I've come to London to talk to the lawyer who, on behalf of Bangladesh Bank, is working with authorities in the Philippines to recover the stolen funds. Obviously, they're doing everything that they can to uh, freeze the assets, and I'm happy to say that they have taken effective steps to freeze uh, all the money. The sad part is, like uh, in many parts of the world, uh, the system is slow. Uh, because it's very formal, has to go through the steps that need to be taken, and it may be a very long time uh, before we know what the result's going to be from the justice delivery system in the Philippines. And if the stolen money can't be recovered, he says Bangladesh Bank will then consider seeking recompense in other ways. We're doing everything possible to recover the funds. 
If we are not able to do it within a particular time limit, then we will look at other options, litigation and so on. You've mentioned RCBC in the Philippines, but you haven't mentioned the casinos. Are they of concern to your inquiry at all? For my purposes, from a strictly legal point of view, I'm just following the money up to the banks because I think using the, the phrase, the buck stops with RCBC, as far as we are concerned. Bangladesh Bank says it's planning to file a civil lawsuit against RCBC. But RCBC says it has been a victim of Bangladesh Bank's negligence and denies liability. Liability would probably attach if number one, RCBC was the one who stole from Bangladesh, which we did not. We had nothing to do with the exiting of the funds from Bangladesh Bank. And second is if RCBC has possession of those funds, which we do not have. So on the basis of those, yes, we, we, we cannot subscribe to any hypothesis that uh, the bank is liable. The RCBC bank manager, Maya Digito, is likely to be tried for money laundering offenses. Bangladesh police have requested information from Chinese authorities about the junket operators Gao and Ding and say they want to know if the men are under arrest in China and if they've been interviewed about the heist. So a prosecution is now being prepared thousands of miles away in Manila, but it's broadly accepted that it's the FBI that's best placed to move the investigation forward. How much progress it's making is less clear. And of course, there's still the question of who was actually behind the heist. What happened to much of the money that was played at casino tables in the Philippines isn't known. But analysis by US authorities and cybersecurity experts contacted by Reuters says the digital fingerprint found at the scene of the crime, Bangladesh Bank's computer systems, points to North Korea. In the UK, the defense company BAE Systems is subject to frequent attacks by hackers and helps other organizations defend themselves from cybercrime. According to its experts, the Bangladesh bank heist bears the hallmark of other attacks, a distinctive code used to erase the tracks of hackers that also featured in an attack on Sony Pictures in 2014. The US government has blamed that on North Korea, a claim that North Korea denies. So we've got a few clues from the tools that these attackers used in Bangladesh Bank and other attacks that we've, we've seen. And the tools are very specific to a group called Lazarus. And this is a, a name that's been given by the security community. Uh, and it's a group that has been involved in attacks on South Korea. They've been involved in attacks in the US. We've seen them in attacks in Europe as well. And they're almost certainly behind this, this Bangladesh Bank heist as well. A lot of people said North Korea is involved in this. I mean, do you, do you think that's a possibility? We can't say for certain. What we can say is that there are links back in terms of infrastructure. So we see hops from the IP addresses that go all the way back to Pyongyang. Ultimately, we don't know who's behind it, though. The Russian cybersecurity firm Kaspersky Lab has also said it found digital evidence that Lazarus hackers made a direct connection from an IP address in North Korea to a server in Europe used to control systems infected by the group. Kaspersky said that was the first time they've seen a direct connection between Lazarus and North Korea. And while it's possible the Bangladesh hackers were trying to frame Pyongyang, North Korean involvement was the most likely explanation. The FBI declined to comment for this program, but a US official briefed on its investigation has told Reuters the FBI believes that North Korea was responsible. And in 2017, the then deputy director of the National Security Agency said private sector research linking North Korea to the heist was strong. With that linkage from Sony actors to the Bangladeshi bank, actors is accurate, that means a nation state is robbing banks. That's a big deal in my view. That's different. And do you believe that there are nation states now robbing banks? Is that your assessment? I do. Allegations of hacking, whether from security firms or officials in the United States and South Korea, are all denied by the North Korean government. But no matter who is behind the Bangladesh bank job, North Korea or an unknown crime syndicate, could there be another cyber heist? Well, there have already been more attempts. 
In 2017, Taiwan's Far Eastern International Bank was attacked by hackers trying to steal millions of dollars using the SWIFT payment system. The banks declined to comment. Russia's central bank has said hackers took control of computers at an unnamed Russian bank in 2017 and used the SWIFT system to steal $6 million. And in February 2018, hackers tried to steal nearly $2 million from India's City Union Bank. The bank said there were similarities with the Bangladesh case. SWIFT won't comment on individual cases, but the head of its customer security program has confirmed that there have been more attacks. I spoke to the uh, security executive at SWIFT and he told me that these uh, attacks, the attempts keep happening. He wouldn't say how often or, or how successful they were, but he said that, the, that these attackers are relentless. And one of the reasons that they're relentless and they haven't stopped is because um, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure it must still be working. If they weren't making money, they would move on to something else. James Lewis is a cybersecurity expert who's advised the UN and American government on information security. I think the issue is the people who connect to SWIFT. And this is a larger pattern we've seen in cybersecurity as the uh, primary target becomes harder, takes measures to defend itself. The attackers move upstream. In a statement, SWIFT told us, attacks will continue to focus on the entry points to payment systems at financial institutions, which is why SWIFT is dedicating significant efforts and resources to our customer security program. This is an ongoing challenge and it is important that both SWIFT and our customers adapt our approaches over time as the threat evolves. It's certainly improved a lot since uh, Bangladesh Bank. The, uh, you know, they, they've accelerated some of the, 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 the previous plans that they had to make security improvements. Uh, they're now rolling out a, a program of, of what's called 27 controls to make sure that all banks using SWIFT uh, are actually following out good best practice uh, security. SWIFT has to take the bull by the horns and, and raise a level of competence. Anybody using the SWIFT system has to be good enough and alert enough. Uh, so I'd say it's SWIFT's problem. I'm not saying it's SWIFT's responsibility. The user and is still the responsibility of the financial institution. But SWIFT has to do more. I mean, personally, it's SWIFT's problem. And I think SWIFT is, is, is rising to the challenge. On the trail of the missing millions, I've visited many places, from the heart of the global financial system to developing countries, all with different levels of technological sophistication. But their banks all share one thing, the messaging system SWIFT. And hackers have realized its users can make themselves vulnerable. Maybe Bangladesh is a victim but, but it is at the cost of Bangladesh that the global payment system is improving. From the biggest central banks and from SWIFT, the largest global banks to the smaller banks, we're all part of the same problem. And trust in international financial institutions is vital. If you can't trust the Fed or the SWIFT system or the transfer system, then you don't even have a banking system. Because what happens when people don't trust financial institutions they pull their money out of them. They don't. Uh, they don't hire people. They don't. Uh, they don't invest in, in businesses. They don't go forward. They all know this is a wake-up call, and they're not going to get a second chance. But enforcing the highest standards internationally is a challenge. Where I think the vulnerability is, is that there isn't a, a global, a more global, uh, coordinated uh, response uh, to these threats. And the hackers have not gone away. It may not be the same, exact same type of hack because they have cleaned up some of those vulnerabilities, but there's going to be other places where they can get in and potentially steal large amounts of money. Defenders come up with a little better defense and the attackers figure out a way around it. So until the day comes when countries agree to prosecute cyber criminals, we'll just continue to see this kind of back and forth. This will continue. The Bangladesh heist was a wake-up call for the international banking system. Changes have been made, but the threat from hackers is constantly evolving, and many institutions regard cybersecurity as the biggest risk they face today.